we've got uh we'll get started it's 5 30 we're still waiting on christian jennifer would you mind texting him just to confirm if you could yep okay uh so we'll call the select board meeting for wednesday january 6 2021 to order and uh, <laughs> just a reminder this meeting is being recorded and uh, let's see, we have in attendance, John Moskevitz, Jane Nevinsmith, Joyce Chunglo, and myself, David Phil from the select board. And uh, I will let you know when Christian joins in as well for the record. Um, so first order of business is the consent agenda. We have warrants PR 2113, AP2126, AP2126 S, AP2127, AP 2127S, AP 2127-2, AP 2127S, AP 2128, AP 2128S. Uh, DPW uh, Highway Labor Truck Driver Appointment, we have both uh, Jeffrey Askew and Devin Glenn uh, that are being hired. And that's it for the consent agenda. So moved. Okay. Did you hear me? So moved. Yep, I got that motion. I need a second. Second. I'll, I'll second. All right. So we got DPW too. Uh, so we've got a uh, motion by Joyce, second by Jane, and any discussion in the uh, consent agenda? Roll call. Roll call. Yep. Phil? Yes. Chunglo? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Wiskevitz? Yes, except for DPW. And Stanley, do you want to vote on the consent agenda? Yes, I'll vote yes. Thank you. Christian is here for the record, so we can name him as being present for the, the Zoom rules. So, <laughs> all right. Sorry uh, for being late. Let's move on to uh, public comments. 15 minutes, please limit your comments to three minutes or less so that others may speak. And I know we have a couple of people here for public comments. Uh, Molly, do you want to go first? Uh, sure, that's your pleasure. Um, so I just wanted to uh, make the select board aware um, and also use this as an opportunity to make anybody listening to the meeting aware of the fact that um, based on a lot of input from other folks in town been talking about kind of the ongoing frustration about trying to get people to volunteer and kind of, you know, thinking about what prevents people from volunteering for different positions when they come up, what prevents people from going to town meeting. Um, a lot of that thread that came back suggested that many people are just, they don't understand it. Like they don't really understand how town meeting operates. Um, they might've come from somewhere else that had a city council or something like that. So they don't necessarily have familiarity with um, this open form of government that we enjoy. And some people are very intimidated. They're afraid about running for public office or even volunteering for a committee because they might not know something. So um, in talking with some other people, uh, a couple of us decided to put together a program kind of as a trial. Um, it's gonna be a two part series. It's called uh, Your Hadley Town Government 101, Understanding Town Meeting, Town Government and the Budget. And it's going to be done remotely, of course, uh, via Zoom. And uh, it's going to be, there are two sessions that are going to be held, one on January 14th, which is um, a week from Thursday, and then the following Thursday from 6.30 to 8 o'clock. Um, I have put this out on social media um, and asked people to circulate it as best that they can. We already have, I think, six or seven people who've signed up for it. Um, again, the intent of this is to educate. So I have enlisted David Nixon's help. Um, so he and I are going to be co-presenter. And then we're also bringing in invited guests for uh, different topics. So I've reached out to some other people in town who are very knowledgeable to see if they're willing to help. And so far, so good. It seems like people are really um, interested in doing this. So again, in terms of content, what we're going to be covering would be kind of an overview of town meeting how it works, um, the Hadley governance structure, you know, the role of the select board, town administrator, the various committees, just to give people a flavor of what all of those committees do. 
Um, and then the second session will be devoted to town finances. You know, where does the town get its money? What's an appropriation and expenditure? How does, you know, what do the savings accounts look like? What's free cash, trust accounts, all that kind of stuff. Again, basic level. Um, it's a lot of information and we're trying to cover it in two sessions. So um, I, I had already reached out to Carolyn and David Phil. Um, both of them are very supportive of this. And, you know, if it works well, maybe it's something that we can um, look at doing on an ongoing basis or even, you know, making it more, more formal. So we're just going to give it a go. Um, wanted to make you aware of it. And um, hopefully you'll spread the word as well. What time of day? Um, it is 6.30 to 8 p.m. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you, Mont. You're welcome. All right. And I think uh, Jim Gnotic, did you uh, go for public comment? Oh, uh, can you hear me? I can, yes. You can? Yes. Okay, because I, I never did this before, so I don't know if I'm set up right. I can't see you guys right now. I'm on speak. Uh, so... I'm calling because I got farmland down at by the Hadley landfill. And can you hear me still? Yes. Yep. Continue. Okay. Because it says done. God, it's got done speaking flipped up on my screen. So, and and I can't see you, so I don't I don't know how to work this darn thing. But when the town capped the dump, the contractor messed the land up that runs right along the dump. He dumped clay, concrete, plastic membrane, hard pan, rocks. He stripped the loam off the top, and I guess that went on top of the dump. Now, I've been trying. I've had that land. I think I bought it the year after that was done. The owner has since passed away, and I know he was upset what the contractor did. Now... I bought this land as farmland from Trust Kessel Trust. And I've had it now probably, what, 15 years or maybe or something like that. I can't get stuff to grow on it. I planted asparagus originally and got very little production, if any. I have this last, this fall, since we had a drought, I went out there and I plowed twice during two months and will Harold every day that during the two months to try to mix that soil up to see if I could make it where I could get something to grow. Now there's still a lot of clay there. What I'm asking the town to do for me, since it was a town job that messed this up, even though the town didn't do it, somebody has to be responsible. Uh, I would like the town to give me a couple loads of loom dumped on the property where I can spread it out there and, or maybe the town could spread it for me. I've, I've got a tractor, but I was out there trying to do a little of that myself and I almost tipped my tractor over, rolled it over the, uh, last month. So that's what I like to do. I, I, I've talked to Selectman before. I've talked to Nixon and he's done nothing. Uh, so I, I'm running out of options. What can I do? Did I bought this chance, land as farmland. Did you have a chance to speak with uh, conservation yet? Just yes, sure. I have. Okay. I spoke with, uh, uh, what's her, is her name Paulette? Uh, Paulette, yes. And she looked at it and she said, there's a lot of clay out there. She walked around, she observed it, and she said she was just going to check to make sure that that land wasn't in a flood zone. And it isn't, it's in a diked in area. It's right next to the dump. Um. Uh, I checked around when, after that, when it first, after when I got the land and found, somebody told me the engineer in a job was supposed to be watching that for the town. I don't know if that was Huntley or Ty and Bond, whoever they hired. That guy is the head of the environmental thing in Springfield for the state. He says there's nothing wrong with the land. I can see why. He wasn't paying attention. And if he was there, he didn't have his glasses on. Somebody uh, should have been watching that job. My cousin, who owns land on the other side of the dump, caught the contractor pumping contaminated water off the dump into his land property. 
And he went to the town and he got the same result as I did. Nobody wanted to do anything. Now, that isn't right. We couldn't do that to the town. So, okay. what can you guys do for me? And I need, I just ordered more asparagus roots. I had a nutri nutrient, which is crop production, put down lime, uh, gypsum, and high powered fertilizer on that land. Try to get it to, you know, soften some of that clay up. I also, when I bought that land, I went to the con I went to uh, the USDA, the guy who does land stuff, and he wrote a report on that. And I'm pretty sure I gave that to Nixon. I don't know what ever happened to that paperwork. He wrote a big report. Okay. On he says that soil that's out there shouldn't is not native to what should be there. Okay. Uh Joyce, did you were you saying something? You were on mute. Still on mute. There you go. My question is, is what year did you buy the property? I'm not sure to year. I bought it, wait, I think, wait, roughly around. Wait. I'm not done with my question, Mr. Ganatic. Hang on a second. What okay, go ahead. You, what year did you buy the property and what uh, type of condition was the property in when you bought it from Kessel Trust? And what did they have in the uh, outline of the buyer sell agreement of how the property was when you bought it? It was bought as farmland. You couldn't really see because there was weeds and stuff on top. They said they didn't know it was that it was like that. So it went from a farmer to Kessel Trust, and then they Kessel Trust sold it to you. So where does yes. the town have? So where does this town of Hadley come in on this? Have you been listening to what I've been saying? I have been listening to you, but but where does it come in on that special piece of property that now you're saying that it was contaminant, or you're saying that it was an overflow the from when they capped from when they capped the dump site. That's right. It, what happened is the contractor used that parcel of land. It, it's not the whole piece. It's roughly about three acres. It's from the fence line. He, the contractor used that for his, his staging area to work on a dump. And that's how he left it. I'd like to know the year that you bought the piece of property. I don't have that in front of me. And, then, and that's irrelevant anyways. So, Nobody could get in a thing no, to grow here. No, no, it's not irreverent. I need to know what year the piece of the property was sold to you. Well, I can't tell you that, and I can, I but I can tell you right now that it didn't turn that way by itself. So, uh, Mr. Gennadik, uh we've we've got your comments, and um, I will follow up with you. But please try to get that information uh, as far as when it was actually purchased. And you, you know something. Is that really that important? I mean, it's like, you know, Listen, I, I, it, it, I tried it, to it, get that straight now when I bought it, and nobody would help me, none of the selectmen. And I, I know I spoke to Joyce Jungle about this years ago, and nothing was ever done. I've just got, just like with uh, Nixon, I got blown away. All right. Mr. Well, Mr. You, didn't, you didn't speak to me about the... Yes, I did. No, you, you talked yes, to me about... Yes, I did. You talked to me about peeling, people stealing uh, vegetables off of your property down in the meadows. All right. So yeah, and I talked to you gonna, about that too. I'm gonna, Nobody did nothing. All right. I'm going to mute this, Jennifer, if you would, please. Uh, Mr. Gennadik, I will follow up with you. Um, and please get that information for Joyce, whether it's relevant or not. She's requesting the information. So that's up to her to decide if it's relevant. And then uh, we will yeah. revisit hey, this in the future. And if, John, go ahead. If he has the nutrients of that soil, I think if we can look at that, and if all he wants is a couple loads of loam, I, I think we can maybe take care of him, yeah. you know. Uh, but I, I think we we do need a little bit more information from him if he could uh, produce that stuff that he uh, gave to David. Well, let's yeah. let's make sure we're not setting a precedent, John. Yeah. They did have trouble when they capped that dump. It rained when they put the membrane on and they capped it with clay. Then they were supposed to put loam on it and they never loamed the rest of it. And there was a lot of issues there when they did cap that. Well, it, I, it's more than since I've been on the board. Okay. Yeah. 
All right, well, we'll move on. And uh, Mr. Gunai, just in, uh, I know this is your first time on, but we do have a limit on uh, the public comment session. So that's why we had to mute and move on here. So um, I will follow up with you. Let's hear for public comments before we move on. I just wanted to thank Jennifer for the and John um, from Hadley Media for the really nice job they did on the uh, farewell for David Nixon. Yes, it was very nice. Okay. Anybody else? Last call. Okay, so we are going to move on to, uh, we're going to skip down to 5.1 COVID-19 update. Dr. Moser's here to uh, give us an update on what's happening and uh, looks like a bunch of changes as well. So Dr. Moser, take it away. <laughs> Hi, thank you, David. Uh, not to interrupt our national coup, but um, mm. we, uh, just a quick report here, an update. Uh, um, as of yesterday, Cooley Dickinson had 18 patients uh, uh, with COVID in the hospital, six of them in the intensive care unit. Uh, there are beds available. Uh, they are not uh, near capacity at this time. Uh, the most recent data for Hadley uh, is uh, available for the last two weeks of December, the last two weeks of 2020. There were 45 new COVID cases in Hadley. Uh, and uh, we had uh, eight, I was notified of 18 businesses uh, who had COVID positive employees over that two week period. Um, due to the increased case numbers uh, uh, in Hadley, excluding the businesses, uh, we're now in the red zone. Uh, in addition, uh, Elaine at Hadley is, uh, I, I think there's like 40 people uh, residents and staff, it might, the number might be higher that are positive. There have been many deaths over the last couple of weeks. So they are, uh, they're really having a go of it there. Uh, the state's involved and the National Guard is helping out there. And um, from what I can see, they're doing, you know, everything right and, and the best that they can. Um, uh, I wanted to bring people up to date just briefly on the vaccines because I'm getting so many questions. Uh, from people uh, from all walks of life uh, in our area. Uh, first of all, the state's launching a new uh, website on Sunday, uh, which uh, will have uh, information for the public, uh, not just information about the vaccine, which is already on, on the website, but this one will have information for people, you know, like when your turn will come and when your turn <laughs> does come, uh, it will be, uh, there'll be details about how you go about uh, registering and, and getting a vaccine. Um, the state's rolling out the vaccine in four steps and each step has prioritized waves. Uh, right now uh, we're in step one, which has four waves. We're at Cooley Dickinson, they're finishing up wave two. They're starting uh, at the, th the third wave, uh, C they call it. And uh, on Monday, there's uh, uh, an Amherst, and I think also now at UMass, there'll be uh, vaccinations for all first responders. Uh, the state is planning on having mass vaccination sites uh, for the future steps that you know will include hundreds of thousands of people. Um, I don't have any inside information, but from my contact, which is twice a week on uh, meetings with local boards of health and all the state uh, officials. I, I have a lot of confidence. I think that uh, they have a lot of people working on it. And uh, I think they have, a, they, you know, are in the process of rolling out a good plan. Uh, and I want you all to know, and just to pass on when people ask you to reassure people that, you know, everyone who's due for a vaccine will get their vaccine. Um, you know, I think I get calls, people are worried that they're going to be left out. Uh, they're not going to be on a list somewhere. Uh, and I just want them, everybody to understand that that's, that's not the case. Uh, the only other thing I just wanted to speak briefly to, hold on a second.
David, yes. are we going to talk about a public uh, session with? Okay. Yep. Sorry, I have no idea how to turn that landline off. Uh, the only other thing that I just wanted to briefly tell everyone here on the select board, uh, because our uh, first responders are going to be vaccinated, hopefully, you know, this coming week, and then three weeks later, they'll get their second vaccine. Uh, and, you know, shortly, it'll be rolling out to people over 75. And so many of us are going to get vaccinated, and we're all going to get vaccinated at a different time. People uh, need to understand that after you are vaccinated, you still must follow public health recommendations and the governor's orders. We all need to continue to wear a mask. We need to continue to social distance, use hand sanitizer, and gather only with people in our immediate family. And the reason being is that uh, once you are vaccinated, uh, right now the medical data shows that you can still get a COVID infection but that it would, <clears throat> it would be very localized on the person who's vaccinated and you wouldn't likely get sick, but you can still have the infection so that even if you've been vaccinated, you can be a vector, you know, you can infect other people. So uh, really from, from what the science uh, and the epidemiology is, look like, is looking like now, it's probably at the earliest, I would say it's going to be August or September before some of these public health measures uh, will be lessened and, and eventually, you know, we won't have to, to practice them. But I just think it's really important for everyone to know that once you're vaccinated, you're protected, but you have to, we have to protect each other. I'm done. So just a quick question. Uh, the number of cases that we've had in town does that include the cases at elaine or is that separate it includes some of them okay i was just curious but the majority of them have been uh local residents okay um and then you had brought up a good idea the other day about having a public question and answer session about covid um and so what I'd like to propose, if I could get the rest of the select board to go along with it, is uh, next Wednesday, since we don't have a meeting, if we could have a select board meeting jointly with a board of either board of health meeting, or if you, if, I don't know if the entire board of health plans to show up or what, um, we could do it at 530 and just have that as the only uh, item of business on the agenda. So that way, as many of us can come as want to, as we want to, and we can just have the public come in and just have a question and answer session. And Dr. Moser, you can enlighten some people. Yeah, I, I yes, I, I think of the slight. It's great for you guys to do it, and I will certainly attend and, and answer any questions. I just, I, I know people have a lot of questions, and people don't know who to ask, and. Uh, you know, best for us in town to, you know, provide this type of a forum for, for, for the town. Uh, is, are any of the other select board members available next Wednesday evening? I, I'm available. And, and there were some other things, Susan, that came out when I'm doing my screenings for my pre-op patients that are going to surgery that um, patients have to be 10 days uh, quarantined um, after they have had a positive COVID. And if anybody is immunosuppressed, they actually have to be 20 days um, quarantined just because we want to make sure that they're safe on in any end of it. So there's been a little twist of different things. Have you heard anything of that nature? Well, the, this, <clears throat> the state, the protocol now for, uh, there, there's people, if, if, you, if you test positive, you go home and they call it isolation, okay? Mm -hmm. If you are a close contact of someone, you get sent <laughs> home and it's called quarantine. It's the same thing. It's just under a different name. For yeah. people who test positive, you have to stay home in isolation for 10 days. Mm -hmm. If your symptoms are improving, then on day 10, you get out of jail. Uh, day yeah. 11, you get out of jail. If your yeah. symptoms, if you're developing more symptoms, then it's, it's extended. 
people mm-hmm. who uh, are close contacts are sent home to quarantine, uh, if they do not have symptoms, they test on day five. Mm-hmm. And if the test comes back negative on day eight, they're out of jail. Mm-hmm. So that's that those are the them is the rules. And did you hear anything about um, it having a 90 day effectiveness after you do have the COVID? Um, there was something along those guys. For what? You mean to get reinfected? Yes. You know, we don't know what the reinfection period is, the reinfection rate is, but the 90 days is um, you don't test any. Once somebody is tested positive, no more tests for 90 days. Okay, that was it. Yes. Because they're, it's not valid. And they still test positive usually, correct? Sometimes, sometimes not, but there's, it yeah. just, you can't use it for anything. So a lot of times people will call and say, you know, when do I test? You know, they tested positive and they want to get out of isolation. You don't test. You just wait yeah. for 10 days. So these will be good things for next Wednesday, too. I think this is a good thing to bring to the public. And if anybody else has any questions, then, you know, I'm all for it. So I'm available next Wednesday. That's fine. Yeah, the more the more information people have, the better off we all are. So. Absolutely. I'm good for next Wednesday, too. I do have one question for Susan. Um, with this UMass thing, at this point, with they're expecting 60% of the students back, is there any way that they're going to reconsider that or the governor is going to reconsider that? Does anybody know what's going on with that, Caroline or anyone? I, I would talk to David Phil. He's got the in with, the, with UMass. They, they don't pay any attention to us, John. We, I, yeah. I know. I know. We've been through. We, we, we've been around and around with them for years. Yeah. Yeah. So, we, we, it's a question that probably should be worth asking. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Jane and Christian and Caroline, are you all available for Wednesday? Is that I'm available. Okay. I'm available too. Okay. So uh, we'll we'll hold a we'll have a joint select board and board of health if needed to post a meeting. Yeah, let's. I don't know how to do it, but you know, try to get the word out so you know people with questions know. Oh yeah, uh, Jennifer can put out a Nixel alert and an email blast. And um, I know I, I talked to Jane earlier about putting out the uh, email to the senior mailing list. Great, and something to the school. Yeah. Can get right. on uh, Superintendent McKenzie's weekly newsletter. Yes. And hopefully, we can get an article by Scott in the Gazette yeah. because that would be really useful. Yeah, if the public has any questions, just have to contact one of us board members or the administrator or something with their question. We can bring it forward to next week. Yeah, and on TV, TV channel also put out a blip on that so that people know. Um, people do watch that 192, 193, so that would be a good um, vet, uh, avenue also. So I do have one concern because people will have to pick up our... Um, Zoom contact probably on the town website. The school meetings, which I've been watching as liaison, have occasionally been hacked. And we need to have somebody really being vigilant about that, about who's coming. That's Jennifer, and she's going to cut them off at the throat. Okay, great. Yep. Complete brutality. I'm on it. <laughs> okay. You're on the police force. Thank you. So last item before we move on from COVID, um, we said we would revisit the senior center and town hall at this point. Um, my inclination would be to leave things as they are with the town hall closed to the public and the senior center closed except for essential services uh, since the schools are closed to students and everything else. Um, I don't know if anybody has any other opinions or thoughts, but uh, we said we would revisit today. So I wanted to do that. Senior center agrees to stay closed. And uh, I guess we can just keep revisiting every two weeks when we have a, well, so we'll do it not next Wednesday, but the following regular select board meeting, we'll revisit it again. How's that? Haley has a protocol all worked up and when parameters get within its <laughs> limit for being opened as opposed to being closed, I assume she will come to the board and ask. Okay. I think as the school department has that 3% um, 
capping that they have, that anything over 3% is something they look at, and then that's when they decide that they will do remote learning at home. So they also, on a weekly basis, look and to see what the numbers are before they reopen the school to hybrid learning. So I think, you know, we're on the same page as they are. I think that's, you know, behooves us to do that. So then, Jane, what I'll do is I'll just let Haley make that request when she feels the time is right, uh, and then, you know, she can come make the request. So, all right. That, um, that may change if, you know, we get a lot of 75-year-olds who've been immunized, and I don't know. We don't know what that looks like yet, and possibly Dr. Mosler can give us more information as time passes, whether that's going to be appropriate to open if we're only open to 75s and older who have been immunized. You know, there are all kinds of weird things about this, but yes, I will have Haley contact you. I get my immunization next week on Friday. I'm on the list, so I'm happy about that. I'm gonna take it. Are you, Joyce, you should do a uh, video of you getting it so that we can <laughs> put it on the Hadley media to encourage people to get it. I was thinking the police department and fire department should do that too. Yeah, I'm. I'm definitely. I'll be there next Friday at on two fifth. No, one on January fifteenth at two p.m. I'll get the injection. So the first one. Yep. You know they got police and fire on there, and what about the water and the wastewater and DPW? Is they're about as essential as the police and fire? They're working seven days a week. Um, right now, you know, first responders were uh, prioritized. They're in this step one. Um, I think essential, you know, that type of essential worker uh, might be at the end of step two. I'm not sure. Correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Moser, but we as a town don't really have a say in that. That's more the, the state, right, and the, the federal government as far as yes. who's in line first, right? Yes. Okay. And I, I think also that as, as, you know, if the supply chain of the vaccine, uh, you know, ramps up, um, I think, uh, you know, these mass immuniza immunization uh, clinics will, you know, will take care of a lot, a lot of people. And I have to say, surprisingly, not everyone is taking the vaccine. They're kind of waiting to see. Um, and it surprises me that even on the healthcare side of it, not everybody is taking it. So um, there might be more vaccines out there than we expect at this time. I think they want to see what the outcome of these are. Um, uh, did you find that at all, Dr. Mosler, that not everybody is taking it? Um, I, I, you know, I'm, uh, my sense at the hospital is that uh, almost everybody is. Okay. Um, but, uh, oh, this, I had this very interesting, the state of Massachusetts uh, did a survey of the general, they surveyed a thousand people. And uh, I think that was 47% they, they classified as, vaccine ready you know they were ready to roll up their sleeve and uh -huh. then it was like 30 something percent who they called delayers who didn't want to be the first one to get it uh -huh. and then there was maybe 23 or 24 percent of people who really were opposed the state's uh coming out with a huge media blitz it's going to be everywhere yeah my daughter had the first one she gets her second dose this friday um no repercussions no um nothing has happened from getting yeah. the injection. So, so yeah. far, so good. Yeah, so far, so good. I mean, I think we all yeah. have to understand that we have no idea what the long-term yep. outcomes could be. We just, there's no, there's no way to know. So. No, no. All right. Um, anything else for COVID-19 update? Any questions for Dr. Moser? All right. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank well, you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so real quick, um, before we move on under business not anticipated, uh, the police chief has requested the use of Russell School for a one day training session. Um, it looks like with, I believe, the police academy or the police training facility. Either way, I just wanted to bring it in front of the board before we said yes officially to him to using the building. 
Uh, Carolyn has checked with the insurance company and we're all set in that regard. So if I could just get a motion to approve that. So moved. Second. Uh, motion by Joyce, second by Jane. Any further discussion on that? Not gonna shoot all the windows out, are they? I hope so. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> all right. Angela. Yeah, that's a good place to train and there's a lot of little doorways in that place for sure. Yep. Nooks and crannies for sure. Jennifer. Roll call vote field? Yes. Tungaloo? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Yes. Wiskevitz? Thank you. And I'm not sure if my internet connection is bad or Jennifer's, but can everybody hear me okay still? Yes. Okay. Was yeah, Jennifer's freezing up, and you're freezing up once in a while, David. Okay, all right, as long as you can still hear me. Uh, let's do uh, 4.1, Town Administrator Report. Uh, Carolyn, do you want to hit anything there? Sure, really quick, I did uh, upload a, a written report, but just real quick. Uh, the CARES Act funding, the good news is uh, they are extending the time to incur expenses for COVID to... December of this year. It was last December, a week ago. Um, we had $471,000 and some change allocated for Hadley. Uh, we've submitted $174,000 and some change. Um, so Jennifer and I will be looking at additional things that we can use that we might need for COVID. Um, Jessica Spank Mabel wanted me to let you know that the town, this town election schedule has been set and posted. Town elections April 13th, as a reminder, town meetings May 6th. And she wanted to remind candidates who are running for office that Friday, February 19th is the last day to obtain nomination papers. And February 23rd is the last day to submit nomination papers to the registrar's office for certification. March 9th is the last day to file nomination papers with the town clerk. And Jessica's doing whatever she can. She understands the challenges of COVID for candidates that want to run and trying to get those papers signed. So she's looking at trying to do something possibly um, at the senior center to have candidates allow them to have the papers there and have people come in and sign them, being very specific about how, that, how that's done to um, comply with the COVID restrictions. Um, how did we obtain any papers from Jessica it just opened up. Oh, how do you obtain? You can call uh -huh. her and she, and she can uh, hand it to you through the door. Okay. Yeah. And um, the board had requested at the last meeting uh, for a level service budget and a level funded budget to be submitted by the department heads. So uh, I've been working closely with Linda, our treasurer, um, and she has put together two templates for each department to fill out. And just as a clarification, and I am clarifying for it, and I already did, sent a memo to the department heads and the chairs of boards that a level funded budget may have increases in mandated contractual commitments, which may impact the cost of the operating budget. However, a level funded budget is the bottom, the same bottom line as this year, as this year. Um, versus the level service budget where they, they want to keep the same level of programs and services current to this year. Um, but by they're, they're, that's going to have somewhat probably a, a higher budget because of cost of living and those types of things. So just letting you know those clarifications, making sure that that is what you had asked me to do at the last select board meeting. I'm not sure I was clear about that, but is that what you want those two separate budgets? Yep, so we can compare what they look like. Okay, and I also asked them to give, it, give me a narrative to explain what the impact would be on those requests. So that's going out tomorrow. And just a reminder that uh, if you wanted to attend the Mass Municipal Association annual meeting and trade show, which is gonna be on Zoom, is uh, on January 21st and 22nd, you do need to register. 
So um, it, again, if you there is a I put it on the town um, town administrator's report uh, how to do that. But if and if you need assistance doing that, Jennifer will help you do that. So that's it right now. My question, my question is, is why are they charging if we're not going down to any of the meetings? Why is there a fee? Actually, that's been asked. At technic the technical expense of running that at that magnitude is expensive. So it's normally, I think, around 375, 385 for, for these for this two-day event. Um, so this is much less expensive. And they do pay for some of the um, speakers that attend, but there's a lot of staff involved. There's a lot of work that's involved. So they still have to pay the salaries for people that are involved putting on all of that whole production. But I think it's technic the technical aspect is pretty significant. They have to hire someone to come in to do that. I don't mm. think the attendance is going to be what it was before. No, no, I don't. I don't anticipate it either. I mean, if you're going to get on and just listen to a a speaker, I don't know how that would cost so much money. It's just mind boggling to me that they uh, would even be charging at this point. But um, anyway, that's my own thoughts. John, did you have something as well? Thought you were saying something. Yeah, um, Caroline, you're gonna sign, if we wanna do it, sign up through you and you can uh, get- Jennifer's the best person to touch base, yep. All right, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna probably take a couple of days of vacation off and finally go to it on Zoom and see, what, see what's out there anyway. Okay. They've been inviting me right along, but this, this sounds like something I can handle. <laughs> okay. We don't have to go to Boston, John. Well, not like I'm not into road trips, but. Right. Okay. All right. We'll move on. Um, next, I have 5.2 select board meeting schedule. Um, I just wanted to make, I think, one change here. Uh, I'm okay with the list up until uh, I'd like to change the April 21st meeting to be April 14th because we've traditionally had a select board meeting the day after the annual town election. So that way we can reorganize and, and, you know, say hello to whoever's on the board for the following year. And then um, at that point, let the, let the select board determine the meeting schedule going forward. Um, but obviously we need to have uh, the public hearing scheduled and the annual town meeting scheduled. So I'm, I'm okay with that. But if we could just change the 21st to April 14th, that, that would be my only suggestion. It's fine. All right, can I get a motion to approve that meeting schedule? So moved. Second. So motion by Joyce, second by Jane. Any further discussion on any of the meetings? Jennifer? Hill? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Miscavitz? Yes. Thank you. Okay, and then uh, next we have license renewals. Uh, Jennifer, what are we doing? Uh, these are the last ones that came in um, at the end, before the end of the year. Um, we have just a few still outstanding. I've been in touch or I'm trying to be in contact with the owners of the other ones, but these are the ones that are um, that have come in and they're current and I'd ask you to prove them, please. Does anybody have questions? Nope, so moved. Please. Second. <laughs> You guys are making me pull it out of you tonight. Come on. Oh, my <laughs> God. Wake up, everybody. <laughs> Trying to enter those dates in my calendar. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Motion by Joyce, second by Jane. Any further discussion on the licensing? All right. All of, uh, sorry, Jennifer, roll call vote. Phil? Yes. Tungalo? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Muscovitz? Yes. Thank you. 
And so moving on to, we're gonna skip over 5.4 for this evening, the uh, fire department appointment, that's not quite ready yet. Uh, we'll move down to 6.1, library, fire station, and senior center update, who wants to go first? No change. Okay. Yeah, I really don't have anything either for the library. I mean, it's pretty much, uh, they're moving in. I think the lights are all fixed. That's been a little bit of a controversy, but that seems good. Um, not much else to report really, as far as everything goes there. Do you have anything for the fire station? No, we're all set with the fire station. We're good. All right, well, that was quick and easy. Uh, affordable Housing Trust. Um, we, this is just to uh, follow up. You know, we had voted to approve the use of the $50,000 for the Affordable Housing Trust COVID-19 rental relief. Um, uh, Bill Dwyer, I think is here, yep. Bill, did you wanna talk about uh, just what you requested from KP Law and what they came back with? If he's here. Sure, let me. <clears throat> okay, a little dark background today, but uh, uh, we did want to clarify with KP Law that uh, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund did have the legal authority to enter into a rental subsidy agreement. And uh, as you'll see from the email from KP Law, uh, the answer is a very strong yes. So we will proceed uh, to, uh, We'll proceed on two fronts. One is to uh, actually start taking applications. And the other is that I have identified all the documents I need to gather to uh, implement the transfer of funds. So I'll be working on that this week. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. And uh, well, any questions on that before we move on? I'll just say thank you, Bill, for doing all that legwork. Oh, you're quite welcome. It's glad to, long time getting here, but I'm, I'm glad we're here. And so just a quick question on the logistics to get an actual, are we releasing the funds to Community Action Pioneer Valley or waiting for applications and then distributing the funds kind of as they come in? We are distributing the funds from the town end, the treasurer will write checks after they are vetted through community foundation or through the, the entity. Because it saves money. That saves us money on the, uh, administrative, overhead. the administrative overhead. Okay, okay, great. So Thank the you. money will never leave our hands until a check is authorized and cut to a landlord. And so did we get funds to transferred from um, Bacon and Wilson to- That's what I'm, that's what I'm working on. Uh, the, the attorney uh, at Bacon and Wilson is a new father and his, his hours have been limited. So, uh, uh, but he's, uh, I, I'm in touch with him and I have collected everything I need uh, to, uh, to work it out, just hasn't happened yet. Okay, anything else on that? All right, next uh, we have driver request for 113 middle and Carolyn, do we need to do anything with this this evening or are we still waiting on the draft link? No, we can, I think we can, um, we, I think we can set some perimeters or suggest, make some suggestions um, and maybe come back with some uh, information for the owner, but I can talk a little bit about that. Did you want me to do that? Yeah, good. Okay. So, um, attorney Jeff Blake's opinion, um, is that a license that was one of the questions can a license can, can be used. And he said, yes. And his suggestion would, is that the select board set some perimeters on it, on the document, but that the owner should produce that document, the, however, if he does it 
through gathering that information himself or if his attorney does that. Um, Jeff did recommend that there should be an end date to this um, with the ability to renew, but that there should be an intent that the owner is working towards move, changing that, moving that driveway down the road. Um, and, you know, we didn't go into exact details about uh, that aspect of it, but he, he just, that was his suggestion that, that, that it not be a long-term license, but to have, again, the suggestion five years with the chance to renew or the ability to re renew. Um, and then he can review it after you set the perimeters, we give that back to um, the owner. And I did talk to Chris about this today, the owner, Chris Price. Um, and he's, he understands exactly what you're looking for, um, but it's the perimeters of what the select board would prefer to be, to be put on that license. So I think we had talked about until the next time the driveway is reconstructed is, is some, I remember that being mentioned. Is that, I mean, I think it's kind of hard to put five years on there or something along those lines. Um, so <laughs> yeah, what do you think? Don't we also need to say if it's sold or gets a new owner? Once, once you allow parking on a certain piece of property, that goes with that property. So I'm not exactly sure if I think we should be cautious about this with it being town property. I don't well, understand why why they can't park in front of the building and not infringe on town property. I'm not I'm not understanding that. Well, the the map that's attached shows that they are actually parking on their property. They're only using the driveway on town property. Yeah, I, I think the issue was right. and the driveway that was that is on town property has been there probably since the 50s when that, that house was built, when Phil Reed built that house. Yeah, yeah. You know, every driveway that goes down Middle Street and West Street go over town property. Yeah. It's, it, it's, a, it's an access issue, but until we did, the school did the construction, it really wasn't an issue, you know? Yeah. Okay, I mean, everybody else doesn't have a problem with it. I don't either, so. I, I agree with you, Jane. Maybe if, if at some point that's sold, then the driveway needs to be moved over. It's still got to cross over town property, but it should be moved over off that easement. So yeah. it could be on the town property in front of the landowner's yeah. lot, so to speak. Yeah, not a, not on the side easement. On the, the driveway will still go over to the front easement, but not yeah. over the side easement. Okay, I see what you're saying now. So the the piece that's in front on this side of the sidewalk towards the the uh, uh, middle street uh, would be used as the town parking. Correct? Is that what you're saying, John? Yeah, you're still going to access it from through town property off Middle Street. But yeah. off the east side of the property, of the house, the yeah. south side of the property is the easement for the drain, the school, the town, and the sewer line goes through there. Yeah. Uh, there, you know, there's a, there's a, a construction easement through there is what it is. Yeah. So at some point, if, the, if it's sold, maybe we should put that in, that it, that it should be moved. Uh, on their property. Okay. Well, then we should write it up as such then. So what do we want? I to put definitely up? think their, you know, their lawyer should write it up. So it's it's their lawyer and our lawyer agree on it, and we sign off on it. Yeah. Okay, I agree. Okay. So for an end time, what are we going to put for uh, when we want this license to end with the option to renew? Uh, when when the property is sold, if there's any change in the property uh, ownership, I I think they need to reapproach us on that. Is that in agreement with everybody? I think that's reasonable. Uh, I, I think that makes it kind of com complicated because 
I mean, we have a lawyer here that's a property attorney <laughs> uh, on the call. We could ask. He's not saying anything. Okay. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, I think that would be complicated with the deed. And then how would that come up? I could just imagine trying to buy a house and all of a sudden you find out that the driveway has got to be moved if you buy this house. Um, that being a tricky situation, I kind of feel like we should either grant them the use as it's shown on this drawing or say that doesn't work. They got to move their driveway north of the birch tree instead of south of the birch tree. I don't know. I kind of feel like a definitive answer would be better. But this came through the planning board, did it not? Uh, Bill, can you chime in on that at all? Are you waiting for us to make a decision on this with the planning board? Um, ultimately, yes, because they are looking to put an accessory apartment addition on. Uh -huh. And um, where the accessory apartment addition goes uh -huh. makes a difference as to what the design is like. So, uh -huh. um, yeah, the original thought was they were going to use the existing driveway, which most of the time is not an issue. So, um, yeah, we're just not, we just don't want to entertain their application until we know what the location on the ground is going to look like. Does this um, present um, any problems with the town that you can see per the planning board? that if we granted this, can you chime in on, a, on it that way? Actually, the, uh, one of the conditions of the accessory apartment special permit is that um, <clears throat> anytime there's a transfer of ownership, the new owner has to certify in, in a notarized letter to the building inspector that they are aware of the limitations of the accessory apartment bylaw and agree to abide by them. Uh -huh. So, um, to address Christian's concerns, um, there are already a lot of disclosures that are going to be, they're going to have to appear on the listing sheet, <clears throat> even uh -huh. before you get to doing a title search on the property. So, uh -huh. having a, um, a license that will expire upon transfer of ownership um, in this context isn't going to be too big an issue because the realtor is also going to have to disclose that buying the place with an accessory apartment means the buyer has to be committed to living there because owner occupancy is one of the conditions of an accessory apartment. Correct. Permit. So we're not, we're not wrong as a select board to ask that there be a condition that it be made aware with contingency about selling the piece of property that this is what needs to be done wait in fact we'll we'll probably put something into the um accessory apartment special permit decision when we uh -huh. write it that the uh -huh. um w when the application comes in and if it is approved as most uh -huh. of, most of these have been uh -huh. we will have a condition in there that will specify that uh, the driveway is on town property by special permission of the select board and that will have to be addressed at um at the time of any transfer okay and as well as the license agreement that you're contemplating uh -huh. and um so there there'll be plenty of advance warning that this is a more complex property than others perhaps okay um, so uh -huh. i will say that in when I do a license agreement, and I do them a lot because you'd be surprised how many paving contractors cut a, cut a corner when uh -huh. they are laying a driveway. Yeah. And usually it's not a big deal. <clears throat> and um, what I put in as a sunset clause is that when the driveway is reconstructed, uh -huh. which may be why David had picked up that because I mentioned that before. However, uh -huh. putting a, a 10 year sunset on it, or we'll talk in 10 years, they, well, that's fine. You, and whatever you want to put in the agreement or uh, upon sale is fine too. From a real estate law standpoint, those are all, those are all manageable. I, I generally put in the 
um, until the driveway is constructed, because once we find there's a problem, it's usually pretty easy to get the neighbor to agree to something like that. And I'm sure in the back of their mind, they're saying, well, we're never going to re reconstruct this guy. Uh -huh. uh, but it's a way to get from, it's a way to get to yes. Um, uh -huh. But that is something I, I'm not giving you legal advice on that. Correct. Correct. You're just giving an opinion. So then why don't we do both? Why don't we say until the property is sold or the driveway is reconstructed and good enough? And if it's in five years or 20 years, then it is what it is. Yeah, I, I, I agree. With... I make that motion. You said, David. Okay. Okay. I'll second that. All right. Any other discussion on that? Yeah, I would just tell them that, you know, if they move the driveway north, they wouldn't have this issue. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that makes it too easy. Which at this point, throughout all the time we've been spending on this, they may just want to move the driveway and get it over with. Yeah. Yeah. Surprised they haven't. Yeah. Jennifer, roll call. Phil? Yes. Tungalo? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Ms. Kevitz? Yes. Thank you. So we're going to, Carolyn's going to get back to them and have their attorney or they themselves draft this document so that way the town is not basically paying to do them a favor by having to pay our attorneys to draft this document. So that's that's why we're, we're doing this. Um, all right, moving on. 6.4 Russell School RFP. Um, Carolyn, you want to talk a little bit about this? Sure. Um, I, we did upload that document as a draft for you guys to take a look at. Uh, we did have two interested parties to the request or letters of interest to see initially who, you know, what was the audience like for um, taking on a, a project with Russell School. And we did have two returned letters. Um, Barry Roberts was one of them. His, he had a very detailed, um, almost like a suggestion or, or possible, a possibility for that building. Um, and then Burkune Builders did come to and got a tour, but once he went through it, just felt like it wouldn't be something he would be interested in. So um, we are going to the next step, which um, David Nixon had kind of uh, played out was to do this letter of interest use what the interest was to try to develop a basic document, kind of a, uh, a baseline of what could, could be done in that building if the town chose to, do, to go in this direction. Um, so an RFP is in draft form um, and it's kind of got the focus of um, what Barry had submitted um, and kind of what the other, uh, I think Burkum was also looking at the same idea, which, which was putting in um, four or five um, apartments and um, that's, but there is some, some more room for some other ideas in that RFP. Um, I think the, what would be helpful for me to know is um, as we go pursue this, do you want it to say sale or lease or just sale or just lease? I thought our original uh, talking way back, and this may have been before your time, Carolyn, was that ultimately the town didn't want to get rid of that property, that we should only lease it because who knows what's going to happen down the line. Okay. Yeah, but a, but a long-term lease, if they were going to do something like that, that everybody would ex accept. Yeah. So let, let's all be rational about this. If you're asking somebody to take over the building, reconstruct it, do the repairs, and in whatever, we're sure in hell ain't going to be alive in 99 years. That's for damn sure. None of us on the board, um, especially me. But anyway, we're asking them to put all this money into it and not own the building. So you could sell the building with... with restrictions on it. I hate to put us in a position of asking somebody to want to lease the building, put all the work into it to make it viable, 
And then, you know, you got to look at the whole picture here. I mean, I don't know exactly how uh, you can ask somebody to put that amount of money into that building and not be responsible for it. I think if you put some restrictions on it, it's only in the center of town and, and the restrictions on it will stay for whatever with the historical society chiming in on what they would feel that would need to maintain that type of structure in the center of our town. I, I think in uh, Hatfield and some of the other places where this sort of uh, renewal of old buildings has been done, they've been done as 99 year leases, something along those lines. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that's reasonable because I, I, I don't know, you know, none of us know what's going to happen in a hundred years and maybe that'll be a, a, a new town hall location or who knows what at the time, you know, uh, I just would hate to give prime real estate to someone for a killer deal right now and then be kicking ourselves, you know, down the line when we wish we had this land back. Can we ultimately look at if we lease it for 99 years, putting something in the lease, it says, Every time it changes hands, the town gets a right of first refusal. Well, you mean leasing or, or? No, so we lease it. And then in 25 years, the developer decides he's going to sell it. And it goes on the market, but the town gets a right of first refusal because the town may at that point decide it needs something right in the center of town. But we can't lease it and then give the developer right of first refusal because they don't own the own the building. Yeah, but no. if you got no, I understand what uh, what you're trying to say, and that makes sense. At some point, if you do want to uh, make that into the town hall and renovate it somewhere 25, 30 years down the road, then it's possible if it does change hands that we could take it back. So with a 99-year lease, though, as a lease versus a sale, the town will still own the building. It will just be leasing it to somebody basically indefinitely. Um, so I'm sure there'll be some sort of provision that says, you know, 30 years from now, if we want to cancel this lease, well, what do we need to do to take the building back, basically, something along those lines. So I think that's something we probably have to work out. That's certainly slopey waters. Yeah, that too. Uh -huh. oh, I, I, think, I mean, we just are putting the RFP out now, so we don't even know if anybody's going to reply to it. So why not just put in there for now, lease, oh, I, I'm for the lease only and kind of explore that options because we might be having this discussion and then nobody wants to do anything with it. Um, and we're just kind of back to square one. So see what people will suggest. Did anyone talk to Barry Roberts about the difference between lease and sale? So I didn't talk to Barry directly about sale versus lease. I did talk to um, Marlene in Hatfield, who's a town administrator there, and she gave me a copy of her proposal. They had intended to do a lease, um, but ended up doing a sale. So Barry actually purchased uh, the Hatfield one. I can look into more, some uh, look at some more examples and get some more information about sale versus lease. If you feel like that would be helpful for the next town, if you're not ready to make that decision or whatever, whatever the board would like to do, I'll do. And, and the use of the building. I mean, that certainly makes a difference also of what they are planning on with doing with the building. So what I would like to do after, you know, Personally, I'd like to see it for lease only, whether it's 99 years or 50 years or whatever, um, mm -hmm. and see what we get. But uh, if that's the direction we go, what I'd like to do is take the RFPs, if we get any back, and then put them out there for the public, do a, a basically a public forum, because the public's going to want to know what the proposals are, what the use is. There's a lot of concern for how the building is going to be used and what it's going to look like. So we'll do a, do a public forum and then have uh, some sort of committee, screening committee, some representatives from the select board, historical commission, planning board, et cetera, to review the RFPs and decide which one is the best fit for, for Hadley. And Bill, go ahead. Yeah, I don't wanna muddy the waters here, but at the moment, Hadley zoning calls for 
uh, one dwelling per lot. Uh, there's an exception that it would allow it to be converted to two dwellings. Um, the senior housing overlay district uh, includes this property and it could be used for senior housing. Uh, it could not be used for market rate apartments under current zoning. So as you're working up your uh, proposal here, I just ask you to bear that in mind. So it could be two apartments, correct, Bill? It could be two apartments. Any, any structure that was in existence at the adoption of the bylaw could be converted into a two-family by a special permit from the zoning board. That's in the bylaw. Yeah. <clears throat> but uh, if it's going to be six apartments, uh, they would have to be, uh, under current zoning, they would have to be senior housing. Or if you wanted to entertain a friendly 40B, the, uh, it, it, which would have an affordability component, it could bypass zoning that way as well. But, uh, uh -huh. but under current zoning, yeah, basically the rule is still one dwelling per lot. Uh -huh. So um, it, that's, and we went through this with uh, North Hadley Hall as well. It, it's not uh -huh. insurmountable. It's just that uh -huh. when you are framing it, uh, you want to be oh, cognizant of the limitations. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay. I have a question on page four at the bottom. It says that the successful proposer must be prepared to enter into a lease or sale and development agreement within 60 days of the 2021 annual town meeting. Is that 60 days before or after, or is it 60 days before? And we ought to put the date of May 6th in there. So I can clarify. Um, this uh, David Nixon was working on this, and I can ask him that question. I've been in contact I, with him. I suspect he means before, so the town meeting would have a chance to vote on it. Um, and okay. I think we should put the date of the town meeting in there just for clarity. Okay. So, like I said, I, I would like to have some sort of public information session if we get any RFPs, because there's a lot of interest and a lot of concern about how things will be used. Uh, maybe get some feedback and then, you know, let's have a, a sit down with the planning board, select board, historical commission, and, and just make sure that whatever we pick is the best fit for the town of Hadley going forward. Um, so that's just kind of what's in my head. But what are, what are the thoughts on uh, lease versus sale putting in the RFP? I, I don't mind leasing it with the RFP, but I just would like to make sure that it falls under some um, guidelines of how what we would like to see with the use of the building. Okay, I just I just think the property is really a valuable piece for the town, and to sell it, uh, short term thinking, I just I, I have a hard time doing that. So I would be for lease only. Yeah, absolutely, lease only. I move that we make the RFP say lease only. For now, and we'll see what we get. I'll, I'll second that. Motion by Jane, second by Joyce. Any other discussion on that? Jennifer? Phil? Yes. Chunglu? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Ms. Gavitt? Yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, Carolyn, anything else we need to do there before moving on? Nope, we're good. All right. Thank you. So moving on to, uh, so let's do 6.5 select board liaison updates. I'll start off. Uh, all I have for DPW is they're out doing pothole patching and uh, fixing, they're fixing a water valve on, on Knightley Road today, the water department was. Um, I will mention that uh, Sharon Gifford, who's been a long time uh, water department employee or DPW employee is retiring on January 22nd, I believe it is. Um, so just wanted to put that out there and uh, we have a job op announcement out for her position. And I think what last count we had like 40 applications for it. So. Well, I'd like to, th I'd like to thank Sharon for her years of service and um, all that she's helped to, you know, bring the DPW 
uh, into what it is and her um, daily routines and things that she's contributed to the DPW, um, the town of Hadley appreciates her. That's all I have from the DPW. Joyce, do you have anything police and fire? Um, not at this point. Um, the one thing that I probably wanted to bring about was the, uh, well, we're going to talk about it later with the North Hadley uh, building up in uh, the, the old sub fire station. So that will come up in the other, other project. Yeah. We, we canceled the executive for tonight. We're waiting on more information still. So oh, okay. We well, I guess we won't talk about it tonight. <laughs> Perfect. Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. I don't know. Did you discuss the uh, status of the fiber project yet? No, I saw them hanging wires today. So uh, you want to talk about that? Yeah, so they, are, um, they have uh, received the fiber. They've been working on it since Monday. Uh, they do one roll a day, so about a mile a day they do. And uh, we're probably looking at sometime mid to end of next week to have the fiber run. Uh, they still have to make all the interconnections and stuff, so I'll keep you up to date. But they are moving forward at a rapid pace. Uh, they are going to be bringing it into the Hadley Fire Station, Police Station. Um, the, the hub of it will be coming in here. Uh, we are working with, it's called AIT and... Basically, it's uh, the Massachusetts Broadband uh, Institute. Uh, the equipment's been brought in to the station already, uh, and we're hoping that we can hook into that. It's a very high-speed internet that was a um, it was done with state funding probably five to six years ago. It was originally put into to support uh, public safety, uh, but we're looking into um, working on that to get our our uh, internet for all of our buildings onto that. Um, that system. So that's where we're at right now. So it's it's running, Mike, from North Hadley to the uh, <clears throat> center station? Correct. So North Hadley is basically the backup. So our center station will be the hub. Uh, mm -hmm. Our station will be a backup to that hub uh, because they're both generated power. Then yep. they run from the public safety complex to uh, town hall, senior center, library, and the Goodwin Library. That's phase one. Um, phase two, if we have funding down the road, would be to bring it down to uh, the DPW and the water treatment plant. And the, but they have all of that built in so that we're, we don't have to add additional infrastructure. It would just be adding the, the line. Okay. And can you, can you find out for me, because I know we have a few bucks left over in our contingency fund, how much it would take to run um, from the center to DPW and the water? I can, I can re request a, um, I can request a, an estimate on it. Yeah. Okay. That would be great. Just to, if we're going to, uh, get everybody else online and if we have any contingency money left over, I think wisely spent since our, um, you know, our good citizens have, allowed us this um, money to be used. I think, you know, if we can use it for that, I would like to do that just to get everybody online. I think that's really important for us to all be connected. Yeah, we just, we're just, um, so there is a little bit of infrastructure after the fibers run. So we just wanted to make sure we had the funding for that. But yes, I can definitely make sure that we uh, take a look at that. Yeah, let's just, let's see what our bottom line is. And uh, when they're in the process of doing this right now, then, you know, then we can certainly look at um, whatever we need to do for the other uh, departments. Okay. Sounds like a plan. Sounds good. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Yep. So on top of that, once that's installed, we'll be working on getting all the badging uh, stuff going. So the card printer, which has already been purchased, which will be housed in the uh, station here uh, mm -hmm. so that it's secure. So any employees or staff, they'll be issued an ID card, which will be that basically their access to get through these doors that we have set up at the town hall and the other new buildings. Uh, uh -huh. So they'll be issued here so that uh, if, if it's an elected person that, you know, gives up their seat or isn't reelected, basically it's just shutting the card off uh, uh -huh. and they get to keep the pretty card of themselves, uh, but they wouldn't have access. <laughs> 
<laughs> one after the other. I, get to, I didn't get to keep my badge. <laughs> <laughs> I want to throw that in there just for this occasion. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so we're working on that phase as well. So we are we are moving along. It's just we'll, we're getting it as quickly as we can. Thank we you. We were very excited to see your people come into the senior center today to look around and check it out. Yep, and that also means that our so the there is going to be a hopefully a good decrease in our costs for internet, obviously, and then the second thing. As part of the badging, after the badging's done, we are hoping to wrap all of our fire alarm systems so that we will come off of having to pay an annual fee for monitoring. And those will be put through directly to our center station here, our dispatch center. So instead of it going to a third party and them having to call us, uh, the alarm will come direct to our, to our station. Great, sounds like a good plan. Thank you, Mike. And, and all the badges will be able to access all the buildings, Mike? Or? I'm sorry? All the badges will be able to access all the buildings? or? Yes. Yeah, so, so the system, they're, I mean, basically, you wouldn't be able to, well, I mean, you're a selectman, so you would be able to go into the town hall. But basically, it's, um, it's all set up so you have access to specific spaces. Um, so if you need to, if you have to have access to, the water treatment plant into the town hall, then yours would be programmed to open those. Uh, Jane Nevin Smith would have access to senior center, specific doors in her space and town hall. So it's very customizable. So your access is limited to what's your responsibility. There's it's the same system, the simplex system we put in, uh, done a DPW um, uh, access your license number, let's say. But uh, it, it wasn't accessed for every, you know, the water, the sewer, and the DPW. You needed each individual department to take your number and enter it in, you know. Yeah, you're talking about for the gas gas keys? That, yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. There was, there was a lot of issues with that originally, I guess. But. This one's actually pretty slick because we're, I mean, we are, we have, we have a similar system. It's a little bit different here at the public safety complex, but... It's nice that you can actually just deactivate, you know, a fob when the person leaves. So you yeah. have to worry about trying to reclaim the key or changing keys out again. So is it a fob or a card? Uh, you're, you'll be issued a card, but if full-time employees want a fob as well, there will be access to a fob. So if you want to keep your card in your wallet and keep your fob on your key ring, you can do that. Um, the, for example, all fire and police will have both. So that if they, you know, if they forget their wallet or whatever, they'll have their fob on their key ring. So that's the we point. have we about the same thing that we have through Cooley. Um, even though I have a badge for one specific facility that I'm able to go through, um, we also have other badges that if you're not signed in by security to go to these other um, areas, then you are not allowed in. So I think that's basically what you're talking about, Mike. Yep. And just the, the, the style of what opens it up. So there's a card and then there's a little round fob. So Correct. Uh, employees would most likely get both. Right. Correct. Okay. Uh, thanks, Chief. And um, Jane, did you have any update on the senior center or schools? Um, I, yes. Conservation also is one of my. Oh, yes liaisons and i want to say that uh janice is still working with the fire chief trying to get uh people to volunteer to be on that committee to figure out what's going to go on in the floodplain with trailers and how that's going to happen um senior center is on um low activity with only essential services being dealt with and the school board is meeting conscientiously for hours a week, figuring out what's going on and God bless them. I think they have a meeting tomorrow night, Jane, is what I read, correct? They had it yesterday or Monday. Oh, oh Monday. Okay, I thought I thought I saw one for the seventh. Okay. And they're going and they're still doing um, at home learning, correct? Yes, and Annie will be announcing according to their metrics 
make, mm -hmm. um, every Thursday night when the numbers come out to the school population, school community, if there will be a change for the following Monday. Okay. Sounds good. And do you have anything from uh, Park and Rec or uh, Veterans? Uh, Christian, do you have anything? Yeah, just <clears throat> the library. One thing I forgot to mention that I remembered is there is in the Russell School, they have a circulation desk that they receive from Smith College, I believe. Um, and they used a portion of it for the new circulation des desk at the library. And um, basically the stuff that's in the Russell School is kind of surplus. So I don't know if, what standard procedure is, if we can put something like that on Craigslist or if it has to go to Municipid or what it would be. But that's something that could, you know, essentially be given away to somebody if they had a use to it. I don't know how we would get the word out there um, that it's available, but there are pictures and whatnot of it. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Um, as far as the library goes, the library, you know, is kind of transitioning over to the um, the new the new library from the Goodwin, and just waiting on the certificate of occupancy um, for the new library before the transition is kind of finalized. I think there are just a few things they're finishing up, and then. Um, uh, I don't have any updates really from town hall. I have a couple things just from the climate change committee. There is a desire to get someone into the town buildings to kind of do like an energy audit of them. So I don't know if there's any opportunity for like Gary or someone from the DPW to be able to walk through the town buildings with uh, an energy auditor, if that's possible. Um, and that would help us too with our green community certification. And then um, the only other thing, uh, some, you know, uh, the climate change committee is always thinking about renewable energy and trying to see if there's anything we can do with the town to have more renewable energy um, being used by residents in the town. Uh, we did that uh, municipal uh, agreement on electricity I think it was about a year ago that we got uh, some feedback on from people in town because it changed the rates in town and there was a renewable option, but wondering if there's anything else. And then another discussion that came up at that committee meeting not that long ago was the idea of doing more of a municipal composting in town. And once we get the, um, the bid for the, the transfer station, you know, if there's anything we can do there as far as composting or whatnot, that might be a little bit more of an organized approach to composting in town to reduce our overall waste. So um, just a few things there. I think that's about it though. So you reminded me of two things, Christian. Uh, one is we were supposed to put out a RFP for solar on the old landfill location and uh, we, we voted on that for the select board know, a month ago. So something to add back to our radar because I don't think that was ever done. Um, and then J Jennifer, yep, could. David, I believe David had reached out to the Pioneer Planning Valley Commission um, because they have experience in it because they had helped Northampton with theirs. So he had reached out to them to uh, help with the RFP process on that. Caitlin probably could just reach back out. I can help out for that. Okay. All right. And then uh, I forgot what the other thing was. Oh, the, the energy audit. I know we had to, part of that was for the green community certification. If we do it now, does it count for our green community thing? Say if we uh, approve everything at Springtown meeting, will it count for that? Or do we have to reaccomplish that then? No, no, it's, just, it's kind of would help us get toward the green community's goal. It's like one you know, we'd have to do the, 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 uh, uh, sorry, the building code, the, uh, improved building code. And then this energy audit is like another thing kind of on the checklist of items that we would need to adopt. 
You could send somebody to the senior center and I can give them the tour of that building. Yeah, it was, there's like one person that would come and I was just hoping we could kind of have him or, or them go to, you know, all the buildings in one day so he's not bouncing around. But I don't know if that's possible or not. I'm sure we can work it out. With yeah, I can look into that. Yeah, okay. I think I think Gary was talking about something like that, and uh, the power company doesn't do it anymore. They've got someone else that actually does the audit for the power company. Is that the way it works? Yeah, this this person was through, and it might be different too, because this person was through the state. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah but like you said, if, if they went through and did every building all at once, it'd be a lot easier for everybody so we know where we're at, you know? Yeah. So my, I also had a question. Um, I've had people ask me about, they used to be able to bring their leaves down to the uh, transfer station and the DPW used to come down with a loader and load it up, but that hasn't happened for a while. What happened to that process? I know we don't have the room at the DPW right now for a giant leaf pile. Um, no, I mean, they used to load it up onto uh, this person that, for the transfer station and load it onto their vehicles so it could be hauled out. We used to uh, provide that service, and then all of a sudden they're not taking leaves down at the transfer station for people. So people are asking, what are they supposed to do with it? Well, that, that is another thing that we, well, we had talked about doing was looking at going out for bid to find a new vendor or, a, or the current vendor to provide additional services. Uh -huh. I know there were quite a few unhappy people with the service cut, you know, cutting a day of service off the, the, the dump availability. Mm -hmm. So I, I would like to take a look at that and see what we can offer the residents before the contractor or the, you know, the year of the renewal, which I believe is in July, right, Jennifer, July, that when the new stickers come out. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I know Valley and Northam does take them, Joyce. I don't know what it costs, but uh, they do take some bulky products and they, they're, they're expanding quite a bit over there at their transfer station and taking a lot of out of town stuff. Not where is it? Town. Where is that, John? Uh, where the old P. Allen used to be in uh, Northampton, East. Oh Hampton, yeah, yeah. Uh, yep. Quite a quite a transfer station, and uh, they are taking just about everything, as far as I know. Okay. Uh, All right. I'll I'll Adam, pass you know, that word. You know cost. So. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. But, yeah. I'd like to say, in terms of our current transfer station. I know that we asked them to um, be more helpful, and that certainly has been my experience with since the new contract was signed, that they are more helpful to people coming into the station. Christian, you okay. know? Well, something for us to look at in the yeah. next next few weeks. And, and I think having some kind of centralized operation would be great. And I mean, there there are farmers I know that take leaves from landscaping services. I think just the tricky thing is, is that when you get into a bunch of people bringing leaves to one site, how clean are they going to be um, versus like a landscaper that would probably keep it pretty clean. So I think that would be the concern with a farmer taking um, some kind of compo municipal compost. Yeah, that's yeah. what happened with the compost yeah. pile we had before, Christian. It was a little out of control and they were bringing everything. That's why they stopped it. If, if it's controlled and they know what it is, a lot of the farmers, I know – They've asked a few, and a few of them are taking them as long as they're spread out amongst the fields. Okay. Yeah, yeah. They just don't want to tire in with the leaves, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, just plain leaves would be great if if we could get a list maybe of farmers that would wouldn't mind people coming and spreading their leaves there. That would be great. Okay. Anything else on updates? All right, last item of business I have for this evening, 6.6 .6 is Hopkins Athletic Fields. Carolyn, do you want to give a quick uh, update on where we are there? Sure. Um, just to, as a reminder, um, that was a concern Joyce had expressed about a resident who had had concerns about 
property that or from the construction site or things that were being done on the field that you couldn't see in the snow and the concern for snowmobilers, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I reached out to Meyer, our insurance carrier, and um, believe it or not, it's one of the first times they've gotten a request for information about something like that. So it actually took a few uh, staff members at Maya to come to this conclusion. So um, this, the whole coverage here, it falls under the Massachusetts recreational land use laws, which gives the town the protection for people using town lands for recreational purposes. Basically, the law states that you are using the land at your own risk, meaning the snowmobilers. Um, there were some other uh, emails that, you know, despite this, that there is, uh, the town should be very um, careful, um, use a, a strong degree of care, um, not to leave equipment out there. Um, um, anything that could be um, considered, uh, you know, gross negligence. Um, how it, but we would be covered um, and the policy would respond to that. Maya would respond to that. But um, they, you know, that is the, the bottom line is uh, it falls under that Massachusetts recreational land use laws. Um, but the town should take care in, in making sure people are aware of the risks that are there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. That's the last thing I have on the list. So any uh, announcements or anything else I forgot this evening? Mm, of course, I always have a few announcements, which uh, are my Saturday night announcements. But of course, um, many people that have um, contributed to our, our town. Um, so I, I feel like we need to um, address our condolences to their families. So I have Lois Warner. And her husband, Terry, and many of her children had gone through our school systems. So I, uh, I offer our condolences to her family. David Logan, who was the husband of Camilla World Peace, I offer our condolences to her and his family. Edward Martula, who was a Hadley resident, went through our school system, actually owned uh, Sam's Auto Repair on Railroad Street for a number of years. Um, we offer our condolences to um, his children, Amy and Jamie. Um, Martula. He also worked for the town of Hadley for quite some time. Thank you. Um, I did remember that also, but thanks, uh, John. Um, and he did have a um, partner for the last few years in, in Irene Hinoski. And uh, his he also leaves his former uh, wife, Carol. Kisa Martula, I can't think of her married name right now, but our condolences to her family. Claire Maddage, who was Claire Philip Poets Maddage, um, she also has passed. That was um, Helen Capinas' sister and John Philip Poets' sister. So uh, condolences to their family. Tara Tully, uh, Tully uh, we offer condolences to their family. And um, you know, I, 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 I'm so sorry that, you know, all of this has happened at this time of the year and it's, it's a hard time for people right now. So our sincere condolences from the select board. Joyce, we need to add Janine Giles. I think I did that the last time. Okay. Um, I believe I did because I did the gardener. Uh, I believe I did the gardeners. Thank you. Uh, supply on Route 9, and I think Janine had died at that time, but of course, um, Janine Giles, her t her husband Tom, who have been um, staunch supporters of our town in giving us our uh, Christmas wreaths for the town of Hadley for a number of years, ever since they own the business on Route 9, uh, Hadley Garden Center, and their children had gone to our uh, school system also and they were very good supporters of any activities that gone on here in town so uh, certainly condolences to uh, uh, Janine's family Tom Brittany and Tom Jr. Thank you so much for this evening take care. Yeah. Carolyn did you have something I forget? No, I did forget to mention that um, 
the ZBA board is in need of a member. They uh, need one more alternate member. Um, if they have some hearings coming up that um, all of the members not be, may be able to attend and that would mean they really need an alternate there. So anybody, as soon as possible, they can reach out to Jennifer. Jennifer Wright, you were the point person for that. Got a letter on mute. Yes, yes. yes. Um, Sorry about that, I just forgot. Email me info at hadleyma.org. It, who 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 resigned from that board? I think it's more they. Um, no one. No one. Yeah. Go ahead, Jen. Sorry. I'm sorry, Carolyn. Carol, as Carolyn was saying, nobody's resigned. It's just um, the alternate's not always able to attend anymore, and um, so it's just good to have an extra backup in case someone has to recuse themselves due okay. to conflicts. Okay. Thank you. All right. So last call for announcements. Yeah, I guess nomination papers are over for political positions in the town of Hadley for the new election period. And uh, could I get, uh, if nothing else, could I get a motion to adjourn, please? Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion by Joyce, second by Christian. Jennifer, roll call. Hill? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Stanley? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Emma Skevitz? Yes. Thank right. you. Good night. We'll see you Wednesday for the Q&A on COVID. All right. Thank you. Have a good night. All right. All right. Stay healthy and well. You too.